Hey, welcome to part two of my show with Greg McKeown. We are continuing our conversation about his book, Effortless. Particularly on this episode, we are going to be focusing on um, how to scale the idea of effortless, how to make um, business more effortless, how to bring the idea of effortlessness into uh, a more of a corporate world and corporate experience. Uh, again, a great conversation, a great guy. Thanks for being here. Enjoy. I, I think that humans' primary need, you know, like that is to be seen and to be heard. Right. Uh, and so if, if people aren't, then then that tends to come out in uglier ways because it's not just a want. And, and for reasons that aren't, aren't entirely obvious to me, and, and I've spent years and years thinking about this, I'm not, it's not just shallow thinking to it, but like why it is that it's such a life-changing, healing, powerful thing to be heard, right? you know, to be, to be seen. Mm. In some ways, that's a, it's a, still an oddity to me. I mean, I, I just was reading Carl Rogers' book. I mean, he's sort of the father of active listening. And, and, and he wasn't teaching just the skill of active listening. What he was observing was as a psychotherapist, at a time when, you know, Freudian psychotherapy was the, was the norm, he, he says, because he wasn't trusting the, the, just the theories and concepts he was being taught. He was trusting his own experience with patients in front of him. What I mean, it was itself powerful and transformational and better than anything that had come before it. Mm. Uh, but, but nevertheless, it was a quite, a, quite an aggressive form of, of taught therapy. And he came along and he's like, when, what I found is that if I really deeply listened, if I could really let in a very sincere way, be myself, be present, and, and they could get to talk without fear of being judged and interrupted and so on, that they, it would naturally spontaneously bring forward something whole and better and stronger and their potential would just come forward right. and they would start to want to take better action. And all of that's just fascinating to me. Like why that is the case? Why, why is talking openly such a, an un, you know, uh, unwinding of all of that that the knots inside of us that they should naturally find themselves you know more more free to change and to improve and to grow is fascinating and so if you take that positive perspective and then you say okay well what's happened to people's ability to be heard over the last mm. you know even the last like year and a half like just mm. a pandemic period non-scientific poll that I just did on LinkedIn, but maybe had two or 3000 responses. Mm. But I said, do you, how do, how do you feel now? Are you, are you more than before the pandemic? Same or less? And we had probably maybe 43% said less. Okay, so that's the 43%. Let's take that as, you know, that as being about the truth for everybody. Mm. That is a big problem, right? Like if you have an, it, it, so, and, and it's not surprising to us, right? People are more isolated now and they, they you know, they, they do feel more separate and that does have a cost because all those benefits that Carl Rogers is identifying in psychotherapy are suddenly not being met when the needs aren't being met. Then when you get together with other people, when you are interacting, mm. you want to be heard more than before because the need's not being met. And so now you can't meet each other's needs in the conversation. Mm. You're, you're trying to just be heard first. And, and so I do think it puts us, I do think it puts us as a, as a, as a, as a quite a, um, quite a major inflection point yeah. in society because people are, are, are trying to be heard in social media. It's not, you don't really get that it's scratched, but you become more and more bombastic in your statements and people become more and more polarized. And, and so there's tremendous opportunity in this moment that we're in. It, 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 but, but it means, among other things, it means that that somebody like Trump, and it doesn't have to be Trump, but the next Trump, that mm. if they are good at voicing what people are feeling, right, sort of a sort of societal restate. And I think he was exceptionally talented at that. I mean, he, the idea he was just stupid or something, I think, is so unacceptably blind and and and. It, of course he was good at doing that. I mean, you don't get thousands and thousands and tens of thousands of people coming and, 
and 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 massively supporting what you're saying if you can't it's not because of you being persuasive that's the wrong way to think of it it's that you is that a leader that can do that is able to say what people already are feeling and are frustrated by mm-hmm. and and it's that collective restate that leaders can do now the yeah i mean i, I don't know, I'm, I'm riffing all over but the the point is is that you've got this you've got this need that must be met if you don't meet needs they come out later in uglier ways they can be taken advantage of they can destroy politicians they can they can make others rise to the top it is your ability to 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 sense that to hear it to understand it uh and uh and and when you don't do it you're going to have more revolutionary type type experiences um, and, and add to that you know recently these whistleblowers that have come forward from google or facebook that are now Basically, speaking, sure. you know, the, the Netflix uh, social dilemma documentary, you know, that we we are now all feel we're in this attention economy and 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 it's their job to make sure we keep scrolling. And if we're not on our devices, they ain't making money. It's as simple as that. And that negativity travels better and we are more engaged with it for longer than positivity. All of these things that I worry about for my grandchildren growing up, I have eight grandkids growing up in a very different world to me at 64 and certainly to you too. I mean, I grew up in Yorkshire in a, in a real community. I mean, we were the, we were the bottom of a cup of sugar from the neighbor. Right. That's how we lived. And it wasn't, it wasn't a government food bank. We were right. each other's food bank. And every single parent could discipline each other's children. I got clipped round the ear so many times by other mothers and my mother would mm-hmm. thank them for doing it. They're all be in jail now, but that yeah. was how we were raised. You know, it takes a village kind of thing. Yeah. So I felt as I got older, my dad would make me stand on the bus for women. When I was a kid, me and my three brothers, any woman, not just elderly or a pregnant woman, he would make us carry the shopping bags home from the bus terminus for these women. He would send us out to shovel snow for the elderly and the disabled in winter. So I carried that into my adulthood. And I, was, I remember being on a plane a while back, helping a woman put her bag in the overhead locker. And she looked mm. at me and said, do you think I can't do that myself? And I thought, wow, chivalry is dead. <laughs> mm. Mm. And that, that, simple, that simple attempt to, to walk in that value in that encounter on that plane became complex and awkward and uncomfortable um, and potentially confrontational with her attitude. And I thought, wow, what happened to all of that stuff that just makes life, it brings the oil of our relationships and smooths things out. But a simple gesture of kindness was misinterpreted and seemed to be a statement about how weak she perhaps was and so on. I want to look at my grandkids coming up in that world. And I've got eight grandkids, as I said, at least two of them, Greg, are weird. What I mean by weird is they don't fit the mold. Um, yeah. And one of them, Indy, she's 10. The education system is already trying to fix her and mm-hmm. she's not broken. So she feels she's a naughty child or there's something badly wrong with her. And she's probably on the spectrum, as they say now. And I worry for her because this one size fits all industrial approach to our kids is killing our kids, as you know, mentioned earlier. So the effortless idea um, yeah, I'm an evangelist for it since I read the book. I've been, and, and lots of my friends that are reading it now that are loving it, that concept. And I can see it can work between you and I, but it can work at scale too, is what I'm talking about with these guys. Why can't it work at government level and at corporate level? Um, I know it all happens individuals, and it's the person you're dealing with on the phone today. I get that. Uh, so I think it's a book in its time. I really do. Well, I love I love what you're saying, and I think I think part of the you know part of the key is, I mean, again, so many places we could go with that, but I, I think about just the, the, the you use the term oil, and and that's a metaphor I use in the in the book for trust. That that w- if you want a high performing team, you you got to build. It's like it's like the the oil in an engine of a car. Right. If, the, if the oil goes down for a bit, nothing happens. It's okay, right? The oil the, the trust level can go down for a bit, and and the engine works fine. But if the oil ever gets too low, that thing will start. You know, every part of the machine, the friction will increase, the heating will increase. In fact, it can completely stop working at some point, and and all for want of you know just keeping up, topping up the oil and. 
And so I do think that that when you, I mean, I do think that I mean, everyone's experienced this. If you're, if you're in a relationship with anyone where the trust gets low enough, everything is hard. Every, just sending a text might take you 15, 20 minutes, half an hour, ask lots of people's opinion. Well, how do I say it? Was that the right word? Right. What does that mean? And, and that's just one little text. It's so hard. It's so expensive. And then, and then as soon as they get it back to us, you know, it hits us hard and we have to, well, what does that mean? And, and it's like, you know, that's the expensive way to do it. Yes. Contrast that. I mean, you're talking about a scale, but contrast that with Warren Buffett when he, it, Berkshire Hathaway buys McLean Industries, right? This is a $23 billion business. So even, but even for Berkshire Hathaway, it's some sort of major uh, business acquisition. Hmm. And they're buying it from Walmart. And, and you know, what would the, uh, under typical circumstances, you might spend six months or more. Uh, uh, millions of dollars with just your attorneys and going through doing your due right. diligence just to make sure that everything is what it's supposed to be, right. which is what makes it so striking how how he operated with that. He he had, um, you know, this was he said it was a two hour meeting and a handshake, mm. And, mm. and he said we knew wow. that 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 Walmart would have everything as they said they would and they did. And so there was no need for all of that six months and all of that due diligence that you'd normally do. Uh, it, was a, it was a handshake. That's, that's effortless. What else can you call it when you right. c- contrast six months and millions of dollars to a handshake in two hours? And so, of course, you have to invest in a variety of ways to get to the point where trust is that high. Right. But it's such a bargain. It's such a high, you know, not just ROI, but ROE, right? Return on effort. It's such a high return on effort. Because as you as you build the trust, then it works for you again and again and again and again, and you're able to then make decisions so much faster together. And if you're in a high trust relationship, I mean, everything's easy. Yeah, everything. And 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 that's true for you know it's true for one on one relationships. It's true with me and my wife. If our trust gets low, everything starts to be hard. If it's high, everything's easy. But I think these are scalable to your to your general premise. I think it's scalable across society and. And of course, if the trust gets low enough, I mean, that's when you start having these, these massive discombobulating experiences. I mean, that's what civil war ultimately is. Right. And three years ago, any talk of civil war would have just seemed ridiculous in the United States. So that right. would, have, would have just been hyperbole and whatever. But you go through to some of the, the, the worst moments over the last two or three years and you go, actually, now some of the most respected institutes at least are addressing that question. Right, right. And you go, yeah, you, even now you, you want to believe it's unrealistic. And I still f- hope that it is and think that it is. But it's like, if you don't build trust, eventually you sign up for the absence of trust and, right. and, and all these things that functionally work will stop working. Yes. Uh, and you can't take it for granted unless you keep putting in that, that, that high trust oil. I remember being in Texas a while back doing one of my communication masterclasses and talking about team building. And this CEO in the room asked me about the problem he was having with his kind of core leaders of loyalty. And he asked me, how do you build loyalty in a team? And I said to him, you build loyalty by asking someone, how's your mom? And I think he, he was so, and then he waited for the real answer as if I was being telling a joke, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and I said, no, I'm serious. If you, and it's coming back to what you said about seeing people. If, if you show an interest in the person as a human and, you know, she did tell you about her mom two weeks ago um, and that you remembered it two weeks later and asked, how's your mom? And you remembered the mom's name. You won't have a problem with loyalty if that's the culture. And he was seemed so disappointed that it wasn't a more organizational answer, you know, <laughs> a more, a more sexy answer than, yeah. It's, it's that, you know, that, you, that we're talking about here. It's that world that I want to live in. It's that culture I want to create in everything I do. How's your mum? Trust built, done, end of, you know? Yeah, I, lo- I love the how's your mum question, uh, you know, as an answer to that and the, the tangibility of it. I, I think about, I think about like, um, you know, back to back to our um, airplane uh, discussions mm. over at Southwest. I mean, Herb Kelleher, the founder of, of, of Southwest, was uh, had built the How's Your Mum into uh, ah. institutional K 
capability really right where where they would know absolutely they would know you know how is your mom and they would know wow. and if your partner or someone was 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 dying from something there would be specific things done for you and wow. and and there was there was a real precision around that an institutional precision around it and this is why so then when he says look what what our business is and we're like we like love our employees and we love our employees and so then they're able to go and love the the customers and look after them and not, you know, not do stupid things. And, you know, I've flown Southwest enough to know, you know, you're not going to get every person uh, getting that exactly right. But, but I have very rarely seen someone in Southwest do something that just made no sense at right. the point of interaction. Uh, you know, I, I've seen, I've seen, I've seen over, a, a, I, I just don't, I haven't seen a lot of power hungry moves or controlling kinds of things done. And I think that's a continuation of that, that, that culture that's been birthed. But then there's, it's not just the Southwest. It's like in some of the other world-class cultures, right? Like over at Apple, one of my pet peeves about the media's treatment, treatment's not, the, 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 the media's way of communicating about Steve Jobs mm. was lazy. Mm. And it, you know how whenever you read the media and you read about something you happen to know about, Right? right, like you know the person they're talking about, or you right. were there, or you're part of that thing, and yep. you go, my goodness, that is just like so not what happened, right. you know, from my point of view, or that's not accurate, and then you suddenly have this awful feeling of, oh my goodness, like maybe everything in the media is that much off, and I just don't right. always know because it's not an issue I personally am aware of, right? You know, right. like so, you've got that sort of problem that happened, I, I I believe, with Steve Jobs. Now, there's plenty of evidence, right, with the people who know him best that, yeah, I mean, he he. there's plenty of things he did that weren't perfect. Mm. But he was so different mm. than the media image of him. Mm. It, 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 among other things, it was very out of date mm. that they had the version of him that got fired 10 right. years before he returned right. to Apple. Well, you have to probably be operating a certain way to get fired, right. right, from your own company. So probably there were some things there, but to get rehired and then to bring around this great transformation, but do you think the same person did the first and the second, or do you think he evolved? It's 10 years, it's a decade. In that decade, he, he got married, he had a family, he'd been at Pixar, he'd mm -hmm. learned a thing or two about the, how's your mom? And even before this, and he could definitely you know, be, make some un, un, inhumane choices before that period. But he still wasn't even then as bad as the media image. Right. Because that's how you're able to build the company and have people be loyal. He just, he just hadn't got enough control over some of those forces within him, some of the, but by the time he comes back, I mean, I, I know of stories of people that, uh, that, that he, you know, went and bought himself a laptop and went and handed it to someone because he knew that they didn't, have the money to get one and so on or, or, or for their teenager. And like, there's all sorts of stories like that behind the scenes that didn't make it into the, the headline of uh, Steve Jobs yelling at everyone kind of story. And, and the people that know him best, in fact, most people that know him best at Apple don't, don't particularly care for Isaacson's biography. And I enjoyed Isaacson's biography myself, uh, but they, they, a lot of them that know him best don't care for it and they weren't especially involved in it because they thought, thought it reinforced a certain version of him. Mm. And they were sensitive to that. So there's another biography by, uh, about him that's less well known. It's called Becoming Steve Jobs, which I think captures much better. Mm. And they do too, the, you know, the, the Johnny Ives and Tim Cooks of the world, that they prefer this other book because mm. it tells the, the evolution. And so, and so I think there's, there's, um, you know, there's, there's something in that to, to remember that, that that, that to sort of to, to recognize that like to be an essentialist like to say it that way to become an essentialist you, you have to marry the focus and the elimination of non-essentials with a humaneness mm -hmm. with with a to, in order to create the kind of culture that can do great work mm -hmm. that's what they always say to me about steve they say they say, do you really think we would have done the very best work of our whole lives for someone who's just a jerk is that what you think is that what you think how it works right that, that human dynamics work like that that you go above and beyond for someone who's just being mean no one does that mm. and, and to do it when you could easily go and leave and be, be a ceo of almost any other major co company right 
and, and you stick around for it and do it for years and, and, and love your work and so on. Yeah. It's like, no, this, this media image doesn't just doesn't do. Uh, and it's that kind of, you know, when you get behind it, you start to go, oh, this person, you know, Steve, he, he loved making it, the product simpler, mm -hmm. not for the sake of it, but so there's some, someone, some customer somewhere, some person who was scared of technology will pick up that tool and just be able to do it yes. and enjoy it and be empowered by it. And, and I mean, basically, in a sense, Steve was like, maybe I can't say single-handedly, but it's sort of like he eliminated the need for user manuals in technology. Mm -hmm. It's a non-trivial achievement. You know, no, one, no one has a, you know, one gets a 50 page manual to use, to use an iPad. Mm -hmm. It exists, you can download it and use it, but it doesn't, he was interested in removing all this to make it effortless. Right. In fact, I remember sharing the title of Effortless, the book Effortless, with a friend of mine at Apple, and he, his response was made me laugh. His first response was like, well, I mean, I, he said, I really like it. He says, but it feels like maybe it's an oversell. And so I immediately sent back to him several advertisements by Apple, where literally the word was effortless on the advertisement. It was just, you know, like the, I, the AirPods where they yes. came out, AirPods, mm -hmm. effortless. Uh, you know, and I'm like, well, it's, I'm not, I'm not the only one then in that in that space. And he's like, yeah, touche, fair, fair enough, fair enough. And it's fascinating because one of the things that I've been very interested in over the years as a communicator is that to me the best communicators in the world are the ones that have a very clear, consistent why. And when I began to do research, as you have done too, I know from reading your book, into Apple and Amazon and Netflix and Uber and Airbnb. Yeah. is what you become aware of and why they've had such a meteoric rise uh, in a short space of time is that their the, the why is not the product they're delivering, but a problem that they are solving. And so Apple are not selling devices. They are selling simplicity. And Starbucks aren't selling coffee. They're selling, I think their branding was a third place between home and work. So they're selling a space and free Wi-Fi and a social experience while you work. And Uber aren't selling cab rides. They're selling empowerment to us because we fed up with the taxi companies having the control. And Airbnb yeah. aren't selling accommodation and so on and so on. It's that's the genius of it. Yes. And I think you mentioned in the book, and I was fascinated, and I'm going to let you go in a minute, but that the, these, these massive disruptive businesses were started by outsiders, right? People yeah, outside well, those I industries. Mean, yeah, no, you're absolutely. I mean, I mean, the Airbnb situation. I've done work with Airbnb and uh, and with Brian, one of the co-founders, and and there's lots that we could riff on with that if we had more time. But the, but but you know, they originally their vision for the company originally was as a, was a, a cereal company like breakfast cereal. That's, that's where they perfect. that's what they were pitching to to investors. And they, I, I know an investor that turned them down and I was like, oh, did you feel bad about turning them down? And she's like, no, that at the time it was cereal, you know, like it wasn't Airbnb and, and they create Airbnb, you know, like that's literally an air mattress inside of their apartment. And they, he said, Brian told me we, we, the, most, the most focused we've ever been was the first 90 days of the company where we called ourselves, we said our goal was to be ramen profitable. That is if we ate ramen noodles three times a day, all three of us together, we could demonstrate we were technically profitable with our idea by the investor conference at the end of that 90 day period. And they could, and they did. And, and you know, it grew up from there into something that at the time, of course, is just mad. That was such a, even now when you think back, it's like such a weird sounding idea. I'm gonna rent out some a bed over there in my, you know, rent out my couch. And yet it's grown into this absolute phenomenon. Mm. Uh, and, and, um, one of the, uh, Chip Conley, who was one of the early executives in the company, I uh, just interviewed him on the What's Essential podcast, and I loved it. I don't think we released the episode yet, but, but I loved talking to him about the insider, inside baseball of, of the growth of that company. Yeah, I listened uh, to it. Has that gone out yet? Yeah, yeah, I don't think it's gone out yet. I think it's, I think, I don't know why it hasn't actually, to be honest, but it will be scheduled in the next few weeks. Yeah. But, but he... he um, he talked about where he was brought in because he's got all this experience in the hotel industry. And so he comes in as like sort of the, 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 the wise man of the team. And one of the exercises he takes them to, you'll just love this, is he divided everyone in the executive team into, into a pair. So he was with Brian and then everyone else was in twos. And what they had to do is they had to write down in two words, 
be like, what business are we in? In two words, right? Okay, so oh. you write down your two words. Then you have to do it again without sharing it with anyone. You just write it down your next two words and those two words can't match the first two words. Mm. And then again, and then again, you do it five times and no words can repeat themselves. Wow. You share it with each other. You talk through and you can select from each other's list one each that you like the most. And then they brought it back as a team. And this is how they, they, how they got to, uh, to their belonging theme. You know, that that was their focus mm. was, was what we're really in the business of. It isn't, you know, isn't selling space or an air mattress or a room. It's to help people to belong right. where, anywhere, belong, belong anywhere. I think that's the term, belong anywhere. Mm. And, and that's been very powerful centering focus for that company. And, and I think it's brilliant that they have it. It's a sort of infinite why. Uh, I just had Simon Sinek on the show too. And, and, and he was talking about this, the distinction between having a goal that is temporary and this sort of the, the infinite why, the thing that you're doing, you're always doing whatever other version uh, of your world that you're, you know, whatever product or service you have, you're still doing the same core, right. you know, the same core vision of why. And, and that, that's helped with, with, uh, with Airbnb, it helped them. I mean, the, you remember the pandemic's like bad for all sorts of industries, but it right. can't have been worse for any industry than mm. the hotel and, uh, industry. Right. And so right. that hit Marriott. I saw the Marriott CEO talk about it. He said in 9-11, we, we, you know, uh, the Great Recession, we lost maybe 15% of our bookings. We have areas that 90% in the pandemic, suddenly 90% was lost. I mean, how do you even survive? Right. Airbnb right. was the same. Mm. How, they were about to do an IPO they're going to be the biggest IPO of the year. Mm. And suddenly this all happens. Mm. They almost go bankrupt. He has to get, you know, one, two billion dollars of emergency funding to be able to make sure that they can survive this and live it out. And right. got rid of thousands of employees. It is very intense, challenging period. But because they responded in a certain way, because they knew what they needed to, to, to try to create, they ended up running that IPO much, much bigger than it had been at their, at their peak. And, and this was within one year. Yeah, it was a really phenomenal inside story. I'm not giving all of the, the no, details. No, amazing. Well you know, the, 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 the old story of, um, uh, you know, Henry Ford with the Model T Ford. If I'd have asked my customers what they wanted, yeah. they'd have said a faster yeah. horse. And I think faster that, horse. Yeah, I love that. And I think so many organizations, politically, corporately, church wise, religious, they are, they are, it's their own version of trying to find a faster horse. And so I feel that we need these disruptors in all these walks of life to come with this zero gravity thinking about what could happen here. That is the effortless thing you're speaking about. Somebody effortlessly sees the problem because they don't have the baggage of not being able to see it because of closeness, familiarity, um, bombarded with systems and compliance. It's that, you know, the emperor's new clothes, the, you know, yeah. the kings and the all together. It's those people that we need in charge. <laughs> yes, I think, I think there's some truth to that. What a, what a pleasure it's been to be with you, Paul. Thank you Likewise. so much for, 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 for having me on here and making this. I could talk to you for, for, for longer and longer. This is a this is very I know, just If we'd have been in a coffee shop, we'd have been ordering lunch now and we'd have carried yeah, on. That's right. That's what it is. We'd have been able to carry on. It's a nice feeling. We'd have feeling. still been on Yorkshire and the Shire, me and you. <laughs> that's what it is. That is what it is. It's uh, It's common... It's common heritage and common vision. It's a, it's a combination here. Hey, listen, how can people find you, Greg? Oh, I think if people wanted to, to, to be involved in this conversation, I would just go to gregmcewan.com and sign up for the One Minute Wednesday newsletter. Great. I think that's the simplest thing. It's, it's free. It's every week. And, and then there's lots of other assets and free assets that come with that, like the podcast, and you're, you become part of that community too. So that's what I'd say. That's great. Well, listen, I wish you all the best on going with the book and other things that you write. Thanks for writing. I loved it. My friends are loving it. Thanks for doing it. It's a labor of love sometimes, I know, but it's 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 really helping people. Very kind of you. Thank you, Paul. Thanks, my friend. Well, I hope you enjoyed part two of my conversation with Greg McKeown. If you didn't get part one, then you can go and have a listen to that right now. I hope this has inspired you to get a hold of his book, Effortless. And again, thanks for being here. I uh, can encourage you, I know I do this every time, but it really helps the ratings of the podcasts if you would leave a review about your experience here with me on my podcast platform. And if you don't subscribe, hit subscribe. Help me get the word out, share this podcast with others who you feel it may add value to. Cheers, appreciate you all, and I'll see you and speak with you all again on the next podcast. Thanks.